everybody. There is a communication hack I learned early in my career. If you say nothing about yourself and ask another person three good questions, people will think you're absolutely brilliant. So here I go with three questions so you'll all think I'm brilliant. How are you feeling right now? What are you noticing right now? What is needed for you to be present and listen in this conversation we're having? I find breath helps me be more present. I get brought into the heart of interpersonal challenges happening within companies and communities. The techniques I've learned, the pro tips I teach, these are the insights that I will be sharing with you today. When I'm asked to train organizations on communication skills for impact, I focus on communication skills that all involve a form of listening. Listening to the self, to be more self-aware of your personal communication style. Listening to others strategically, to pick up on the subtleties being conveyed. Listening to more effectively connect with others and bring value to your life. Listening is the secret sauce for impact, and each of you has the capacity for huge impact, the power to connect to another human being and give them the gift of being truly seen and heard is a superpower. It's a power that changes and saves lives. Many people don't realize that they are suffering from a lack of human connection. Loneliness is an epidemic, and it has grave consequences. Studies indicate that loneliness increases the risk of dying by 26% and has a greater negative impact on lifespan than excessive drinking, air pollution, depression, or anxiety. As Brian Resnick articulated, loneliness is associated with higher blood pressure and heart disease. It literally breaks our hearts. What I'm saying is that loneliness is comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and it's killing us at an individual and societal level. This is precisely why being able to communicate with others and make them feel heard is a superpower. It's one of the reasons my team at Listenly is so committed to providing deep listening for others. Even when engaging with others, too often people aren't confident in their communication skills to make a meaningful connection. A shocking 22% of millennials said that they have zero friends, even as their lives are increasingly digitally connected. As millennials take over the workplace, you can bet they are looking for a workplace culture that adds more intimacy into their lives. So whether you want to leverage this power to go professionally, personally, or to join me in my mission to heal the world, the quality of your listening matters. Listening is a muscle. You're not a good or bad listener. Like effective communication, it's a tool set, a suite of skills that you can use in different ways at different times. So how do you harness your listening and communication power to create impact? It starts by identifying what are the goals of a conversation? There are two goals for every communication interaction. Content and feeling. The first goal, content. What do you want someone to know or understand? The second goal, feeling. How do you want someone to feel about that content, topic, or situation? And how do you want them to feel about you? Many companies miss opportunities by keeping their focus entirely on the content goal. How can you and your organization increase your impact by keeping both goals top of mind? There are nuances that influence the feeling. Multiple channels of communication being perceived when we're all listening to each other, and you can't opt out. Whether you're conscious of it or not, we're all innately doing it. We're perceiving the message, the structure and wording, the oral delivery, tone or vocal variety, the nonverbals, people's body language, and the visual information, how information is shown, the way it's packaged through branding or visual design. 
all of these variables change how we feel about content. As a communicator, the skill is in engineering these variables to hone the message that you're going to convey. As a listener, it's a trainable skill to place our attention on these variables and to notice how do they impact us. So, how do you tune up your listening skills? A key part of listening and paying attention is figuring out who are you talking to and how do they think. I want to teach you a tool that's going to raise your game. But to do that, we need to go back in time, way back. Aristotle back. Because over 2,000 years ago, Aristotle tried to figure out how do people think? How do they reason? And he figured it out. The patterns of reasoning. I'm going to share two words. You might be familiar with these words, but I'm going to teach them in the context of listening and communication. You can use them to observe how others communicate, to better understand how they think. Communication detective work. The words are inductive and deductive. So if I'm an inductive thinker, what does that mean? It means I like to share specific pieces of information that lead me to a general conclusion. It's known as going from the specific to the general. Give me the background information first, and then tell me what you want. For example, so my sister tore her ACL, which was a huge nightmare because she's like a really active runner. So as she was healing, thank gosh, she asked if I would do a marathon with her. I said, of course, but she wanted us to wear all matching outfits, all white. So I found this whole white outfit, but the sneakers were so hard to find. I went to the mall, but all they had was all those neon colors, you know, kind of cute, but really not white. So then I actually ended up finding this one pair of white sneakers, and I don't want to get them dirty. So is it raining outside? <sighs> What was my point, my general conclusion? Is it raining? But as an inductive thinker, I don't think you'll understand that question unless I tell you about my sister and her torn ACL and how hard it was to find these white sneakers. As a listener, how did that make you feel? What did you infer about me when I shared all of those details? So if I'm a deductive thinker, what does that mean? It means I like to share the general conclusion and then maybe give specific background details. It's known as going from the general to the specific. If I'm using my previous example, but doing it deductively, it might sound like this. Rain? That's it. And what does that mean? Is it a Beatles song? OK, so both of these examples are outliers to demonstrate the extreme. But it can be as nuanced as inductive. I don't want to get my sneakers dirty. Is it raining outside or deductive? Is it raining outside? I don't want to get my sneakers dirty. It sounds subtle, but the difference is significant. There can be huge tension between inductive and deductive thinkers. If you're paying attention, you'll start to see this all around you. You'll see someone explaining something in an inductive way to a deductive person. And it's like they're going blah, 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 blah. They can't hear the other person. If you want to be effective, then knowing inductive and deductive is the tool. The skill here is in being able to recognize and leverage both. You may find a boss likes to share information inductively, but likes to receive information deductively, quick and concise. You may find one approach works better than another for a given topic or situation. What is it like for you as a listener? How does your filter of inductive or deductive thinking change the way that you perceive another person or the information that they're sharing? Consider this. A client found a way to get two times the amount of users on their product. Awesome, right? So she went to her boss. She asked for 50K, and then she laid out the whole vision of how she was going to make it happen. But the boss didn't hear her. They heard 50K and then got stuck at that number. They weren't able to hear all of the supporting information that would have demonstrated what a low-cost solution it was relative to their current approach. When explaining new information, it's a great time to be inductive. However, if your boss calls after hours and says, we need to talk, you want to hear what follows as deductively as possible. 
you likely have a natural state, inductive or deductive. As a listener, you can train yourself to hear the difference, to recognize how someone thinks. As a communicator, you can explore your impact when you vary your delivery between the two. Importantly, knowing that both of these exist, you can be more compassionate and address tension when it comes up in conversation without anyone needing to be right or wrong. Now that we're getting a better sense of how people think, how do we as listeners discern what someone cares about? This is the key to being persuasive, to changing hearts and minds. To do this, we need to understand people's mindsets. Still way back in ancient Greece, Aristotle also taught us that people have mindsets that instinctively drives what someone responds to. It's broken down into three parts. It's the modes of persuasion. Ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos, credibility, persuasion through reputation. Pathos, emotions, persuasion through feeling. Logos, logic, persuasion through logical reason. So let's dive in with the first mode of persuasion, ethos, which we're going to go into with the most depth today. Ethos, credibility, everything from who you are to how you look, what company you work for, your job title, where you went to school. People who value credibility carry themselves in a particular way. You might know someone who loves to name drop the college that they went to, or really likes to wear certain recognizable brands. These are all different ways that people indicate their ethos. Words can have ethos, positively or negatively, such as the term human resources, which has been rebranded in many companies as people operations. Ethos changes in different communities, such as the CEO, who's at the top of the pyramid at work, equal to their partner at home, and has varying levels of ethos in different social circumstances such as she's a student in a beginner Spanish class. Content can have credibility because of who supports it, such as if it's coming from the entire executive team or the top five companies in the industry are doing it and you want to adopt it too. These are all great ways that leaders of new initiatives gain buy-in by effectively leveraging others' ethos. What is your ethos? Do you know? What gives you ethos with friends, family, and colleagues? A great example of someone being mindful to the persuasive power of ethos is a psychologist I know. She works with a lot of shopaholics. And in order to build her reputation and build her ethos, she has a phenomenal wardrobe because it made her clients trust her more. The second mode of persuasion, pathos emotions and feelings, how you're delivering content and any kind of emotion being put into it. If you're listening, you'll notice people use pathos to make information appealing to listen to. They make content appealing by sharing it through an example or a story, and they leverage an emotional channel such as excitement, anger, fear, or curiosity. If someone values pathos, they'll create an emotional experience through enhanced gestures in their vocal and nonverbal delivery. Take me, for instance. I have a lot of pathos right now, <laughs> lots of gesticulation, and I was aware of my pathos as I got ready today, keeping things colorful with my pants, a decision to let my hair be down, to be in full expression. Let's talk about a product that you've seen advertised, earbuds. How do they sell them? People dancing, the most athletic group of folks doing acrobatic dance moves all over the city. It's two little pieces of plastic sold almost entirely on pathos. If I'm talking to somebody who values pathos, I'll ask them how they feel at their new job, lean into questions about the emotions to build a connection. With my team, I might put a funny meme on a PowerPoint to get their attention or make something I'm sharing more memorable. I leverage a lot of pathos in my leadership style. And the third mode of persuasion, logos. Persuasion through logical reason. For example, data, charts, research. If you're listening to someone who cares about logos, 
they might show you through their love of pie charts and statistics. Advertisements that persuade through logos will say, buy one, get one free. In short-sleeved English, sometimes people will like to say, it just makes sense. If you're talking to someone who cares about logos, show them the data. Stick to the facts. We, as human beings, are persuaded by ethos, pathos, and logos in different ways, in different environments. Consider how you're using all three the next time that you ask for a raise. Ethos, credibility. Remind your boss of your reputation, the clients who request your presence on their project. Pathos, communicate how you care personally and are emotionally invested in the team. Logos, show them the data, the value that you've added, numerically speaking. What are all three of these like for you as a listener? Has something ever been communicated to you with too much enthusiasm and emotion that you didn't trust it? Or did you ever see a fact shown as a statistic that made it feel cold and harsh, devoid of the humans that those facts were representing? So, when you ask somebody those three questions that will make people think you are brilliant, they are actually your opportunity to listen deeply, to information gather, and to learn. Through the other person's answer, are they demonstrating that they are an inductive or deductive thinker? Do they care more about ethos, pathos, or logos? The last skill that I'm going to share is how you can show up as a listener on a whole new level. How you can create immediate impact in a conversation that will have large-scale impact on your community and the global community that we're all a part of. The skill is pace listening. It's a contemporary skill for a contemporary problem. Pace listening comes from the work that I do at Listenly. Through digital and in-person meetups, we have participated in and facilitated hundreds of listening sessions intentional time where a listener's undivided attention is focused on really hearing someone. We've been observing what makes people relax, feel heard and understood. The listening skill for how to be human and how to hold space for others to be human too. The antidote to loneliness, workplace politics, and many issues we face in the workplace and society at large is to authentically be present with one another. This is an essential part of your job and everyone's job, because it's a human job. To gain buy-in for an idea, or to have a difficult conversation, to be effective, we all need to have the ability to deeply connect with others. Here's how to practice pace listening. P for present. Stay present with yourself. Stay present with the other person. What is real in this moment? How are you feeling? Maintain eye contact and face towards each other. A for authentic. Are you saying what's real or what you think the other person wants to hear? Human beings are very intelligent. They can feel the difference. Give someone the gift of increasing their awareness by sharing how you're really feeling. If someone says something and you get a pit of anxiety in your stomach, share that. Ask how they felt, invite them. C for curious. Follow your thread of curiosity, not assumption. When we're focused on trying to change how someone feels, instead of our curiosity about them, we are only depriving ourselves as listeners an opportunity to really understand what's happening. An E for empathetic. Can you be open and non-judgmental to really be here with them? You may only have five minutes to do this. In another five minutes, you may have to turn around and tell them exactly what to do because that's your job. But if you take the time to truly be empathetic, it is amazing what you will learn. And the word pace itself, which illustrates that every conversation is different and moves at its own pace. You can be an advocate by keeping this in mind. Is it only people who think and communicate quickly whose voices are being heard? Or are you creating opportunities for all different kind of communicators who move at different paces? 
Pace listening is a way that we can humble and nurture ourselves. It's a way that I have humbled myself many times over. During a time of difficult transition within an organization I led, I finally took the time to really listen to team members and their distrust of leadership. I opened myself to being curious and empathetic. It was not without pain, but it inspired me to show up more authentically. And the results? They trusted me so much more. It led to an initiative of listening. The whole team cohesion shifted, and the culture, with an increased foundation of listening and communication, began to thrive. So my friends, how are you feeling right now? What are you focusing on right now? What is needed for you to be present and listen in the interactions you will have? Pace yourself. You're just getting started. Go ask a question to someone you know or someone you've just met out of real curiosity. Go be brilliant. Thank you. <laughs>